out. I just don't want to miss it in case I uh, I forget. Oh. Um, you know what? I think why don't we go ahead, even though we're like a minute early. I think I want to just get started and because um, we had a lot to cover, and we'll we'll do our best to try to keep this right on track at an hour. Is there anybody that does need to sneak out a little bit, and we can let you uh, speak first? Is there anybody that has to leave before an hour? If I could, I would. My my daughter has a soccer game that's starting at seven thirty, sure. but um, I'm yep. hoping to be out by eight. But I want to make sure that I'm understanding everything that's here. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so let me go ahead. I'm going to share my screen too. Let's see. I'm working on my tinier laptop tonight, so my real estate here is a lot smaller. Um, okay, share screen. Okay, can you guys start seeing, hopefully it'll start refreshing. Do you see my, um, yeah. my Google I, window there? I can see it, yeah. Okay, great. So I put two links in the chat room, and for our design team, they should look very familiar. One is the uh, design, um, I don't know what we're calling the thing JR put together, um, what we're calling that the... I don't even the know catastrophe. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the <laughs> catastrophe. The module template, I guess is what we're calling that. And then this is my original design plan where I had been storing all our agenda and meeting notes, so I'm kind of retaining that still. Um, so if you go to today's date and, and scroll over, this is what I hope to accomplish in an hour, which I know is way more than aggressive, and we probably won't get there. Um, but what I'd like to do is we, we do have the opportunity tonight to, um, to have the subject matter experts here. So what I'd like to do is get kind of a status check from everybody for each of their sections, and we'll give the SMEs a, a general sense of how we're laying out the 12 weeks of the MOOC. And as you're going through your section, if there are things that you think you'd like their input on, you know, this is why we invited them tonight, so certainly do that. Um, but we don't necessarily need to repeat what we, we talked about last week, but maybe just give us an update of things you're working on or questions you may have or um, ideas that have come to you since the last meeting. Um, and actually, it's kind of a weird thing to do, but before we lose everybody um, uh, or start losing people, uh, I kind of wanted to put this at the top of the agenda. If we could do this again in two weeks, for me, it worked really well to keep me on task. Um, and if I promise to keep things at an hour, I hope this isn't too cumbersome that we, in this early stage of the design, um, meet every couple weeks. So that would put us at uh, November 11th. Um, if I looked at the calendar uh, correctly. So off the top of your heads, does that work? And if not, during the course of the meeting, just let me know if you're for a different time. But it seems like this is working pretty well. Um, so with that, um, let's pass it over. Stacey, you're in the second week, so I think we'll catch you pretty early. Um, why don't we have Eric and... Um, and John, give us a sense. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep promising I'm going to shut up, and then I, <laughs> I remember other things. I also, on the first part of the table of the content, a table of contents, I, I mentioned last week we do have now these 12 weeks to play with. And so I know some folks are saying, gosh, I, I need a little bit more than a week, or I, it would be nice if I could maybe align with um, somebody else. And so take a peek at this as we're going through at this table of contents slash schedules page. Um, and hopefully for those that asked for it, I gave you a little bit more cushion. And, um, and I think Jessica and Josh were thinking there's two modules dovetail nicely. So, um, and the idea <laughs> being we'll open up those modules at those intervals. Um, rather than opening up all 12, 12 weeks and having a free-for-all within Canvas, we'll open up um, the weeks as they're kind of laying out here in the schedule. Um, so take a peek at that, and, and I'm interested in your feedback as, um, as we progress. So now I officially, I will be quiet <laughs> and, um, and let Eric and, uh, and John give us a sense for um, how things are looking in, in module one. Eric, you want to start? Well, you can start if you want. <laughs> um, so Eric and I um, have made a lot of progress. Um, just to give an overview, um, our week is going to be in, in four parts. Um, the first part is going to be discovering your learners. Part two is going to be understanding your learners' needs. Part three is going to be understanding the instructional performance context of your learners. And then part four is going to bring everything together um, in regards to um, giving everyone, it's going to be, we're really going to get into the iterative process of understanding your learners' needs and context. We want the learners to understand that what you get in 
week one you're going to use throughout the whole process and that you're going to keep on going back to it and it's going to sort of be driving your design as you move to all the other weeks. Um, we have developed five personas just to bring everybody up to date again. Um, one of the challenges obviously is trying to get a good grasp of who the learners are and the way we're going to do that is we've created five personas and we created these personas to represent different types of learners who would be taking the GED under different scenarios. And it's in a narrative type of format. So these people are telling their story. They're explaining you know, who they are, how they got to where they are, what they want to accomplish. These people have names, they have we, we've, we've given them you know, a look, there's a picture to go with them, and they really tell a story from first person. Um, the research shows that when you are creating these personas for you to design to, um, when you can do it from the first person, it gives, the, um, it gives you the opportunity to interpret and also to really get an understanding of who the learner is. Um, so we have those kind of going through the whole process. Um, we're also going to be using an exercise where we're going to show learners how to have empathy for um, these personas and how that can help drive um, the design as they move forward. And you know what, John, can I just um, interrupt you for one second, just so we are kind of on the same page as far as, you know, we got a lot of, we were tossing the word learner around for different groups. <laughs> so yep. maybe for our purposes, um, let's talk about learners in terms of the GED learners. Yep. Let's call them MOOC participants. Is that okay if we call the MOOC participants the one that we're designing this instruction yep. for? Is that okay? That's um, fine. Just to clarify for the, uh, the, the SMEs what we're talking about. So. Yep. So oh, just to clarify, so John's talking about this, their section, uh, when he's talking about the learner persona, it's giving our MOOC participants um, um, em em embedding them in the, kind of the GED experience. So who, who takes the GED, what are their motivations, why are they doing it? Um, and that's, <clears throat> again, as he's saying, st setting the stage for as they design the instructional modules, they'll have this as the base uh, for understanding who the learners are. Yeah, we, um, we're, we're trying to create the context as much as we can. Um, you know, we, we used personas that have been developed before we tweaked them, but we also had to do a fifth persona because we found that we did not have a persona that represented someone that's in a fail setting. And, and we know that that can be a very um, specialized area that has its own context in regards to... Um, what setting, John? What setting? A setting of someone that's in jail or prison jail. Okay. Uh, because we know that if you're designing a learning session for someone that you know is in a prison or jail setting um, there's constraints with that and one of the constraints is that there's no internet um, they've got computers but there's no internet so you have to keep those things in mind so we did um, include a fifth persona which um, we think is a really important one so, John, would you like um, the SMEs to take a peek at those personas um, just to see if they ring true, or would that be helpful at all? I don't want to insert, you know, another layer. If you don't I would like go. that, actually, to take a sneak peek. Yeah, we would love to share those um, with them. They're, they're in a good format right now. So, Jennifer, if you just let us know the best way to get it to them, um, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, you know what I'll do after we're done here? I'll send around an email to all the designers of uh, the SME's um, email addresses. And Great. Maybe you, that's yep. the best way to, to uh, tackle that. Fantastic. Okay. Do you want me to talk a little bit? About... Please, Eric. Okay, so um, I think that um, we were having a little bit of a struggle getting our stuff into the module template. Um, but we tried our best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so tell me, so talk about that a little bit. So, um, you know, this is obviously, we're just giving this a, a whirl. What, what was the struggle? Yeah, so I feel like the template is, um, and this, um, I have some questions for this means too, but I feel like the template is uh, an assessment tool and not a design tool. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I don't have stuff developed, right? We're still, 
we're yeah. not on that stage yet. So I, like, I, I totally know what you mean, and that's why I think I keep relying on that other thing that I keep talking about the uh, the what the thing I created because I, I got to the same point. I I didn't want to put a bunch of junk in there that I hadn't wasn't fully thought through, and I think that's what you're saying, right? <laughs> yeah, and then on top of that, you know, you know, we agreed on the terminology of module mm -hmm. for each week. And so then we had to try and figure out, okay, we had already decided we were going to do four, right? Half hour sections in our week. So then we started breaking those out as parts. Um, and I think John and I had to, it wasn't tough, but we were negotiating a little bit of terminology. Um, I really like what John's doing with the persona things, but usually we would call that sort of like learner analysis. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've changed that wording a little bit and you can see in my sections, I'm really looking at the needs mm -hmm. right? for adults mm -hmm. for the most part, I'm, I'm going to suspect mm -hmm. or near adult. <laughs> right. Um, so, and because we don't know who the designers will be, or what their backgrounds are, you know, these could just be good Samaritans that want to take the course because they want to help their communities or something. I just did basic stuff, right? So reasons why students want to complete a GED sort of thing, <coughs> try and figure out, have them think about the needs relevant to completing that, mm -hmm. um, or maybe why they hadn't. And then things that, you know, your average person might not be aware of. You, you might have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but this kind of stuff's really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially for adult learners <laughs> who we know that adult learners, right, they're going to only do the pieces that they need and then move on. So if their basic needs can't be met, then we can't teach them. So, um, so there's a little bit of that. And then there's a little bit of gap analysis um, and then some reflection on um, how their learning uh, journey is different from someone, right? So we all assume that everyone has been on the same path. There are a bunch of us here who are either doctors or soon to be doctors or, <laughs> you know, so all of our learning paths aren't the same. So that's going to be the reflection part in part two. And then in part three, I wanted to break out, okay, so what's the instructional environment, the context, right? Are you going to do this in person? Are you going to do an online piece? Um, if you're going to do it online, right, that doesn't work for jail or prison. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece was, I imagine, like myself, I've never taken a GED, right? So you have to figure out what the performance context of your learners is going to be as well. Right, so you need to know about the test. <laughs> you need exactly. to know that that context. So mm -hmm. that's what I was like. I I was going. I went to the GED website and I was trying to figure those pieces out. And you know, we started pulling. We pulled our pieces together as best we could to fit into the the template. We did a context summary for each part. Um, we did relevance to practice. Of course, this is the practice of IDT, not necessarily the practice of designing GED. Mm -hmm. So that's a little weird. That's a little meta. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's a, that's a little odd, but it, I think it works. We put some key terms and concepts in there. Um, we have some basic learning materials, but again, I'm not an expert in GED stuff. So it would be nice. I'd like to have links out for people so at the end of each session they could go find more information they could go um, do research outside of our half hour each day so anything a SME could give me on that would be great yeah and you know what um Amanda I see that you're here too I think um if you wouldn't mind if I kind of <laughs> assign you to, to this first module because this really is I think you're probably the um, best in terms of you work with so many um, uh, instructors and teachers from a professional development standpoint. And really what we're trying to do is in this first section is to give folks like us who are instructional designers who are going to be working on these modules context to understand what is 
the GED about? Um, why would someone take it? Who are the learners? Um, what you know? What's the instructional setting like? Those types of things is what we're trying to um, to get get across in this section. W would you mind, Amanda, um, working with these uh, this group, John and Eric, to to give them some insight on this to see if there are you know again that it, it sits well with you as far as what what we're pulling together. Yeah, of course. Okay, so um, so I don't know if you, Eric and John, have you met Amanda? I don't know if you, <laughs> but if she's in, or not met, obviously for me, it's <laughs> face. but if you are aware of her presence, <laughs> as is me. But um, the, her her role is to work with um, with adult educators in a professional development um, standpoint, and so really that's I think Eric, what you're getting at is to help us get across this idea of. Who the learners are, who the instructors are, those types of things, and I think she's she would really be able to help do that. So. Yeah, and I think too, you know, like one of the the things that we're trying to do here, John and I together, and especially with the personas, is that we're we're trying not to say, well, this is the only situation, <coughs> right? Because I suspect that you you will not find the same path every learner that's trying to go back and get their GED. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So yeah. that, that's why we have the different personas and we're, we're, we're not doing typical <laughs> sort of like learner analysis here. Um, and I'm, I specifically was trying to stay out of like ID books. <laughs> uh -huh. right? so I was, ta I was like, so what, I mean, what, one of the, the books that I grabbed was the Dirksen book. And, and that's really for, you know, that's a very light, I would call that IDT light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it's really effective for someone who's, let's say, dabbling, <laughs> right? They're, they're volunteering and doing something like this. I think, I think they're, they're good resources. And um, before I move on to group two, just to give John and Eric a quick question, uh, are you, as far as getting some SME input, did you have any questions specifically tonight, or do you want to let this process play out where I'll give you their contact information and you can start plugging away with specific questions to them? Yeah, let's do that. And, and you know, maybe there'll be, um, uh, let's do the latter, if John's mm -hmm. okay with that. Uh, yep. My feeling is it might be nice for, it's Amanda, right? Mm-hmm. My feeling is it might be nice for Amanda to look through it. Um, she she has access now to the template, right? Yep. You can see yeah. it, Amanda, right? You you when I gave you the link, you were able to click on it, right? Yeah, I've looked at it. Okay. Yeah, we actually have um, uh, a similar document that lives outside of the template that might be a little easier to read. Yep. So as long as I can get your contact information, I'll add you to our outside document and you might be able to help us there. Yeah, that, that works. And I think if you just, when you reach out, just give me some specific questions that you guys have and I can look at it with that lens um, mm -hmm. in addition to my normal yeah. lens. I would tell you right, right, right now, in between now and wh whenever that happens, if you have any links, right, out to resources, that, that would be great. Right, okay. Can, can you be a little bit more specific because I love sharing resources and I might end up <laughs> overwhelming you rather than helping you? Well, I, I think what, what I'm looking for specifically is um, like in part three of our plan, um, there's, a, there's a bit in here specifically about gaps and things, right? So, um, I have like links out to the GED site, but th there might be some links of like, well, here's, here's what the average statistics are or that kind of thing. Um, not necessarily like links to learning materials, but links to try and understand the needs of, of students taking well, Understanding the, the demographics and then understanding the need within that. Yes. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, and there is some good stuff out there as well, it, you know, to even show uh, stratified to like grade level, like for those who have not achieved high school equivalency, um, you know, where they left off, you mm -hmm. know, that's kind of interesting too to see, you know, you kind of assume, oh, someone must have dropped out in 11th grade or whatever, well, unfortunately, 
there's a <laughs> vast majority are probably ninth grade or below um, in most levels. So that's, I think, to add to your point, that adds some good context for the designer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, thank you guys very much. Um, let's move on to um, the next two folks. I guess it's JR and Stacy. Do you want to lead in on this one, Stacy? Sure. Um, okay. I was. I was unable as well to get some of my stuff in, but JR and I got, got most of it, um, well, some of our objectives and stuff. So um, I was unable to, after, like we worked together the one day and then after that I couldn't get back in. So I have a separate page of kind of, kind of like what group one does of a whole layout. It's similar to what you have, mm -hmm. Jen. Um, basically um, in this um, module, um, we're going to focus first on the um, scope and focus of a lesson. Um, this is really kind of going through um, the idea of what goes into a lesson, your, your um, you know, the goal, the um, a standard that you're, you're aligning it to and such. And then um, moving into the, um, the open resources um, that will help you to identify those goals and or um, the resources that are going to help you to um, for those performance objectives to meet those performance objectives so um, basically I have um, and I think JR went over this with you guys last week um, where we have like a module overview of what's going to be happening we also um, reflect back on module one um, in reference to what they um, have learned and what they discussed, just kind of like a brief overview. Um, and then we kind of go into where, where are they um, with planning a learning plan, creating a learning plan or a lesson plan? Like, have they ever done this before? You know, where are they, um, the, the MOOC, what were we calling them, MOOC leaders? MOOC participants. Uh, yeah, participants. Yeah. <laughs> MOOC yeah. participants. Um, what you know where are they have they ever done anything like this are they coming from an id background are they coming from a teacher background are they just like eric said like a good samaritan off the street have they any idea on how to um, outline or um, lay out a particular lesson so just defining those things defining the scope um defining who this is for um i don't have my notes in front of me um so it's off the top of my head um so basically we're going through um again the the goal the topic wh who who you know who are they teaching um going back through what what um the guy said in the first module and then um uh, uh taking like here this was my question i don't know whether we wanted to start with the standard and then go into everything um changing the order a little bit we i, I just wasn't sure because sometimes you want to start with that standard and then start to create um your performance objectives um or measurable objectives underneath of that so yeah. And this is actually a good point. Like, like let's make a, a decision um, on a pretty big thing that you and I talked about probably three weeks ago or so, Stacy. That uh, when we surveyed the SMEs, and this is SMEs, please please pay attention to this question because it's a biggie. Uh, we we tried to ask questions related to um, your perception of most important need, whether that be math, whether that be English language arts, science, social studies, and then at what grade level. And mm -hmm. so when Stacy and I were talking. Um, would this be a, a better to approach this thing? Okay, we're going to work on math for grade level D. And that's what we want everybody to work on. Um, because it might help to focus what you're talking about now, Stacy, how we go through the standards and then also all the way through to the end as far as, you know, how the, mm -hmm. the modules lay out and things. So, right. um, so this means, do you have, um, how would that, or, and, and the designers, how would that sit with you if we drew a line in the sand and said everybody who's taking this MOOC will be designing a math module for a grade level, whatever, or whatever it may be, English language arts for um, a certain grade level. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, uh, we do. I do a lot of competency based. So we, we, first of all, the standard is something we have to look at. Are we 
assessing the standards or the assessment is that linked to the standard or to the indicators that are often associated with the standard. So once we, we make that determination of what the assessment is, I think, the, as Stacy said, the, the, the place where we start is always this is the standard that we must, uh, that's the goal, that's, that is in fact the goal um, that we must achieve through the assessment at the end, you know whether or not we have reached the standard and the objectives come out of that. But the main thing is to make the determination because depending on the subject area or depending on the, you know, depending on the how the assessment is connected. Sometimes in some disciplines it's connected to a standard and sometimes it's connected to assessment at an indicator level. So once we we need to just clarify a little bit that then I think that progression that Stacey referred to sounds good. And then what about though in terms of limiting ourselves to a specific subject area? Uh, for the, for the like if we can't kind of think that this as being what the first MOOC of many and mm -hmm. so this MOOC we're going to tackle English language arts and then the next MOOC we're going to tackle math. Would there be any advantage for us as designers as well as for the learner um, to segment the topics that the MOOC participants would be working on, the, the units of instruction that they would be working on? Definitely cleaner, for sure. You know, otherwise it becomes more a smorgasbord to me. of <laughs> uh, So if I am, like, you know, you were saying, we don't know who these people are and what their background knowledge is. So uh, maybe we keep them on a subject and then go as as deep as we want them to go it might prepare them also on the side to have to develop some of that content you know and instead of going one day math sounds like sat once math once uh, english once you know etc different things mm -hmm. yep oh i'm missing the chat rooms happening here is anybody um answering this um yeah, there's the standard. That's Annalise is talking about the standard is the goal. Yeah, right. That's what we. That's what I do with my all my competency based is whatever we do is all based on the standard. Okay, so Jessica um, brings up a good point, um, and I think Jessica, you're saying you're kind of making a counterpoint, saying someone may be coming to this saying, I, I teach um, math, and now you're making me do a lesson on English language art, language arts. I'm not interested in doing that. So is that what you're saying, Jessica? Yeah, I think that was the concern was just that as long as we have one defined place for them to find the standards and we're really clear that these are the set of standards you have to choose from and this is where you need to start from, that it doesn't really matter if they pick uh, ELA or science or math as long as you know they build on a standard first because that way they can use whatever expertise they already have and whatever comfort level they have rather than trying to learn a new subject and how to design and you know those types of things. I think that was. Mm -hmm. so how, does, how, does, how does that sit with you, Stacy? given you're the one that has to try to um, describe I, the menu? I, here. I agree. I do agree with Jessica and I agree. Um, here's my thing. Like I think as for an example or when we're showing examples, if we, if we could stick to one subject, but in terms of what they're going to design and what they're going to develop, I think they should be able to choose from a list of standards. And like she said, if somebody's more of an expert in math than they are in, in writing or, or reading, then they certainly should be able to choose that standard. But for example purposes, maybe, or for um, learning purposes, if we structure it, like, a, and that's what I kind of do in my activities. I have it, um, for example, if you're doing something in science on the solar system, you know, this is what the topic would look like. This is what the um, main goal would look like. This is what the standard would look like. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so, I guess so just for our development purposes, if we could pick one subject, because everyone might be able to use that in their samples as we go through the modules. Do you know I, what I mean? I totally do. I totally do. Um, so then, um, and I think we'll, we can go back and refer to what the responses were, but certainly CCRS was the, the biggie. Um, and then, unfortunately, when you compare that, even though the GED is based off the CCRS, they uh, have a different way of addressing science, for example. They go after the net gen, next gen science standards. Um, so my personal preference is we keep everything to the CCRS. Um, and, okay. you know, cause I, well, again, just for this idea that 
<laughs> Where will it end? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot out there. And I honestly have been spending a lot of time at each, and that's what I was going to ask them, um, ask some of the um, SMEs, what, what, um, what standards are we going by? You know, like which ones are we using the most? What do you see the most of being used? Because there's, there's so many different ones for different states and different places, and uh, it's all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, well, welcome to adult ed. <laughs> um, so this is Amanda, and I would urge as strongly as possible that you stick with the CCRS. Um, all of the federally funded programs are kind of being pushed in that direction. And what happens most of the time is that programs that aren't federally funded oftentimes partner with those who are. So they tend to follow the same path. So there's such a push for CCRS. Um, and teachers want it so badly that not only is it going to benefit the students, but I think you'll actually get an enormously rich pool of participants for your MOOC because people want to be involved because they're upset because there's not lesson material that are aligned to um, to the standards already. So I think it's a win-win awesome. on, on both, both ends. Well, that keeps it easy because I can, I can, you know, obviously let them know about the other standards that are out there, but if we can focus on one set, it really would make a big difference. Yeah, I think that's, that would be the set to stick to. So then, Amanda, a follow-up question to that. Um, clearly, the, the coverage of social studies and science within the CCRS um, is more in terms of English language arts. Mm -hmm. um, so is that fine? Uh, again, like I said, the GED goes off to the next gen science standards, but for the purposes of what we're doing, we'll just, even though we're, we're hoping this will help folks that are preparing for the GED, it may not be a perfect alignment given how they have a, a little bit different setup with their standards. That, you think that's okay? I think that that's okay because I think the people who are teaching science have been using the next generation science standards for a couple of years since they've been out. Okay. Um, and I think because of there's such a push for complex text in the CCRS in terms of mostly nonfiction and it specifies social studies and science that I think it will naturally merge with what people are already doing um, with the next generation science standards. Perfect. And actually just to kind of give a counterpoint to my point, if you actually look at the science questions on the GED, they really are English language arts. They're all English questions. language arts, yeah. yeah. So. And I think where, when appropriate and where people are familiar, if they can make some sort of linkage, like uh, in a footnote or something, if you're teaching this as part of, you know, a, a science class as well, this aligns well with the next generation science standards X, Y, and Z or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. If As you okay. felt like you needed to include them somehow. Okay. Okay, we made a decision. Yay, guys. <laughs> okay, so here forward, CCRS uh, is all we need to worry about for our purposes. So that's big. That's big because the yeah, that is yeah. big. That's huge. That's I'll cool. I'll continue then. I didn't develop a whole lot. Um, how about them putting the standards? Um, after, because as uh, from what I just heard, some of um, some of the SMEs were saying that you that you start with the standard. That's your main goal. Then from there is where you start to develop your other um, um, sub-targeted goals or what have you. But um, I'm actually I actually show them the standard, then a main goal, then more targeted goals or performance objectives. Um, as well, so. And actually, um, Stacey, um, the, the, what, where your section really comes into, um, that your first bullet point, the scope, because um, you know, as you're drilling down, as you're saying standards and the outcomes, you're really only gonna be able to cut for a 30 minute lesson. I know. <laughs> you know, it's a pretty, pretty, and that's what we run into every cohort is, um, is, is that ability to, to pare down what the, yeah. uh, what the lesson's gonna actually be. So they actually, they actually okay. incorporate that within you know what you're talking about yep. <laughs> as as then, uh, we were going to put in the assessment too um we had mentioned before that um there was really no um, assessment mentioned um in the original outline so i know that um you and jessica had mentioned something about performance objective um mm -hmm. assessment so I have a little part of that in there too. Um, and then it looks like Felice kind of goes into learning outcomes as well and may discuss it a little bit more. So yep, that's perfect. Throw that in there as well. So yeah, there was a question that um, a couple of folks addressed in the, um, in the discussion board and Amanda made um, a point that don't worry about, I think I brought up the point, should we talk about the tape testing and things like that? She said right. about it. Don't, don't worry about okay. that. Okay. Um, 
And then, um, as we also mentioned, for the most part, the assessments that we've ever dealt it with in the past and prior cohorts were all associated with what you're saying, with, with what Felice is going to be talking about next, associated sure. with the um, instructional mm -hmm. strategies and make, you okay. know, the learning process, not necessarily, you know, the mastery. Have they mastered the this objective to the point that they could go to the next level? I think that's beyond the scope of what we're okay. able to do. And that's my opinion. That helps. That's my opinion. Yeah. Does anybody else <laughs> want to contradict that? that um, no, I, go down. Okay. Yeah, it's just important to just let them know that these now these need to be assessed, like these objectives that you're creating, they need to be something that can be assessed at the end. So, okay, that helps because that can cut down a little bit on time. So oh, can I just uh, ask a quick question? Sure. So there will be some sort of practice opportunities. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think in like adult ed language that those types of informal assessments are are sufficient and okay. then the teachers will make that determination if they have to uh, reteach or you know do something else in order to go to the next step so i think as long as there's ample practice opportunities included then you you're meeting the needs of the teachers and the students perfect that that's perfect that's exactly what we're talking about practice mm -hmm. opportunities yeah that's a good way to, to put it probably so, okay, so as long as, it, so that would be kind of like an informal well, a practice opportunity within the lesson, and then the, the, the instructor will determine, or the facilitator will determine whether that student will move on, is that what exactly, you're saying? Exactly, okay. so, okay. so we, we don't need to necessarily come up with like a, <laughs> another a post of. test, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. That's fine. I was just going to mention different types of assessment, to be honest with you, <laughs> and then you can kind of, they can kind of pick which one they would like to do like even a, a anything there's all kinds of assessments so all right that's great i'll, I'll do that and then we move right into that um, finishing off with the standard i might rearrange that a little bit and then um, moving into the oer which jr can speak to so uh the idea here is that once they've got um the scope of their lesson figured out and what standard they're looking at is that uh I've got part three, which is a really brief overview of copyright and creative commons. Um, although probably a lot of people in the instructional design field have experience with this. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I put a very simplified version of, about creative commons in here um, for people that maybe are less familiar with it or um, haven't come across it at all. And then launching into open educational resources and the, the activities in this section are built around giving them an opportunity to say, okay, this is my lesson plan, this is my lesson uh, outcome or like where I want to take this lesson. Um, does something already exist? And if it does, um, how's, like, is it at the right age group? Um, does it actually suit my needs? Is there some, some way I can make it better? Um, so they actually get some exposure to different OER repositories uh, that thank the SMEs have uh, provided some and I've added some other ones as well. Um, and that they take the, uh, a modified version of the Achieve rubric, which is a, a series of rubrics to evaluate OERs. And they get to, they go and, and kind of explore uh, what already exists. Um, there's a, a section way down the line, uh, it's like module seven or eight, um, where they're evaluating their own. And so this is kind of a nice, mirroring effect where they've already kind of gone and, and looked at evaluating uh, an existing OER and then when they come back to evaluating their own or their peers that they've already had practice doing that. Okay, this is perfect, JR. So I, I got, uh, I, I'm, I'm now doing the last three modules. So this absolutely, I will definitely come back and circle back to what you're talking about because I did see those achieved, those are um, actually embedded within OER Commons. Um, they so, sure are. <laughs> so that's perfect because I, I was wondering how we we're going to tie it together what you're talking about. So I will definitely I bookmark that in my mind. Hopefully I don't forget it. <laughs> so. I um, I saw like you left a comment way like in module seven or eight or, or which one that was. Right. And, uh, I think I, I left a reply to it that like it's great because this is also geared in module two. Okay, perfect. Was that it? Um, yeah, and then, yeah, we finish off with a, a series of reflection questions. Um, so 
this is, we talked about how discussion posts might be involved uh, with this particular MOOC. Uh, so some of the community engagement would be to um, answer the questions, kind of like describe what the lesson plan you're making, why it's interesting to you, link to the OER you found, and describe some of the reuses, revisions, and remixes you might make to the materials just as some prompts. Um, but at this stage, I think, um, clusters could start to form. I haven't figured out exactly how to execute it, but at this point, if they've decided what lessons they're on, if we have 15 people that have decided they want to do something with, uh, I don't know, factoring, I always pick on that from math, mm -hmm. um, but that it's like, oh, I can find in the discussion board other people that are also working on factoring and that uh, um, hopefully we can, we can build in some community building into the MOOC. That's a great point. And you know what, and I have such grand hopes for tonight, but I think um, what we're doing now is probably about as much as we can handle as far as going through the topics, but let's make sure in our next two weeks, let's start really turning the corner and thinking about what you're just describing, JR, how we're going to incorporate the reflections, how we're going to incorporate dis discussion boards, thinking about potential ways we could set informal groups up, those types of things. Um, let's make that, let's set the bar for our, in two weeks that for each of us, we, we think about how we're going to do that piece of the design so great great segue for next week to that well thank you you two um anything else did you have any questions um did you want to have any like the group one is having, having a SME partner is, is, do you guys um need additional help or do you want to just have more ad hoc questions um um, I would it, I would love their um, emails and um, that if I do have questions, if I could email them or my outline kind of thing to have them go over to see, you know, if it's following the right sequence of how they're how to develop um, the development part. So if if I could just, you know, I think you said you were going to do that. You were going to share um, their emails so I, I can chat with them. But thank you very much for being here. Yeah, this is really helpful. And I just want to again point everybody to the chat room. Amanda um, and Annalise have been having a conversation about some of the um, uh, lesson plans. Again, we're instructional designers. We don't always think about things in terms of lesson plans, <laughs> but um, certainly this is really applicable to our audience. And um, I think um, you were saying, Amanda, this is what they tend, how the, the type of format they tend to use um, when, when planning their lessons. So yeah, I mean, most people are familiar with it. Um, and if they're not familiar with the actual term, um, they oftentimes follow the process um, intuitively. Um, so it's just it's just a nice outline to have. And then I just wanted to also say to I think it was Jr. who was just talking. Um, I've done a lot of presentations on OER, so if you want me to share any of those with you, including all of the resources that are embedded within them, um, I'm happy to do that. That'd be great. I just can't see uh, who's actually talking right now. <laughs> so, oh, and this is Amanda. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I'll be I'll be in touch because I'd love to see those. Yeah, sure. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, how are we doing on time here? Um, we're gonna go a tad over, but not hopefully not too terrible. <laughs> so, um, Felice, you're on deck. Hello. Um, um, first of all, I want to apologize. I didn't do on the module template. I post my information on the um, draft that you created first. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but That's to, by tomorrow, probably I will put in a module. And uh, what I have done is I get the um, I collected the, all the content. Is content is ready, and I find out my activities. My, I, I have like three day lesson plan instead of four. First day is gonna talk about learning outcomes. Next day is going to be about uh, learning outcomes and the first principle. Next day is gonna be the instructional activities for each four steps. And then um, the last day, how they are gonna make sure they are gonna match the objective with the learning outcome. Mm -hmm. So what's gonna be, and I have a bunch of activities like for activation, I found like different activities for like such as for activation, brainstorming for application or like integration, like a ponder activities, six, um, six heads or job aids or reading or presentation for present for the demonstration activities, like a presentation, different types of presentations 
and like for the application games demonstrations and i'm gonna tell tell them how they can use these activities how they can create these activities for each objective so what i want to do i want to look at the objectives from module two that jr and stacy are creating and i want to take those example objectives and tell them how to do activities like what's activation activity or what's like do activity what's integration activity mm -hmm. so the the course is gonna be like building up so they will have a more clear picture i just didn't want to do like go find some objectives and come and teach them that's what i thought but i can go either way yeah i like this idea and i think this ties into what stacy was saying if we could come up with one standard one object you know and come up with an objective and then use that example throughout our modules i think it, it, unless felice i'm going off on a tangent that you didn't mean but no, no. Uh, that's what you're it's exactly okay and then stacy does that tie would you mind stacy and um felice uh, maybe this is a good place to start doing that. Just yeah, that's perfect. I, I'd be happy to come up with that and, and pass that on to her. No problem. Yeah, I will do too. And uh, for the final thing, I'm going to teach them every day. The content is ready. I'm, I know the activities, just I need to find the objectives, which we will do with Stacy. And then the other thing for the final part, I'm going to, I don't know if we are allowed to do it, but I'm going to give them a job aid. So they they are gonna know the um like a bunch of questions like for the each principle of instruction what is gonna be their instruction plan and what type of activities they can do it's like an application but they can like print it out post somewhere and each time they creating a lesson they can look at it yay I love that I totally love this is the book that needs to be written, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I think that we all struggle when we're doing this to come up with ideas for each. I mean, we all know it's important to have these first principles of instruction, but in terms of putting it into practice, I think your job aid will be fantastic. I love it. Oh, yeah. And then um, I'm, as a, as a, like, and there I, I have like at least like close to 20 activities, instructional activities. I am explaining and exampling and I'm showing examples and non-examples so they can differentiate that uh, and they can pick whatever they want to use. It's going to be also in the instructional, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be also in the um, job aid thing. Uh -huh. So th this is, and this is, this is what I have done so far. And I'm gonna upload everything to the module, like a module plan instead of the other Google document. Yeah, that's fine. No, that's fine. We're, in fact, I think it's, 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 I'm shocked how much is in here already. So this is, this is great. And as we talked about last week, this is our first step before we actually input within Canvas. So I wouldn't even be surprised we have different iterations of this before we, we have a final clean draft to go into um, to upload into Can Canvas. But um, did you have any questions, Felice, for the SMEs? Um, uh, not the SMEs, but I have a question for you. Are we gonna do like a PowerPoint and voiceover thing, or is it gonna be just the uh, how it's gonna be? You know what? Um, let's let's, let's kind of talk about that a little bit. My idea was we. I'm sure some modules will lend themselves to having like a video with a voiceover. Um, but you know, obviously, right now everything we're doing is text-based as we get things out. Um, what, had anybody thought about that in terms of like the development stage of what you want to start doing in terms of additional types of media? I um, are we allowed to upload PowerPoint? I I mean, yeah, PowerPoint 2013. You can create like a awesome stuff, like really interactive courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was hoping, Jessica, maybe you can speak to that. I was thinking the same thing, Felice, of doing some type of um, interactive, either through PowerPoint or articulate um, storyline, and being able to have it be more of an interactive piece on, online. Canvas will do that. Um, they have, so they have a media server. The only challenge with that is the videos, you can't see the back end of where they live. So like if you delete a video and or want to move it around. There's no real file structure behind the scenes, which is totally fine. Um, on our iteration, we chose to use Vimeo so that we could kind of keep control over, you know, if something's deleted, really deleted or where things live. Um, 
So, you know, whatever we decide to do as a group, whether we post videos somewhere else or upload them directly to Canvas, it will work. Um, what about something like a slideshow, uh, like an interactive where they could click and, um, you know, it would take them to a new page or, you know what I mean? Like, it's, is that it, possible? If it gives you some kind of HTML5 output from whatever you make it with, mm -hmm. it should be fine. Okay, it's yeah. It'll embed anything. Okay. Um, and I know they have a lot of different kinds of third-party plugins, so they may have something directly from uh, okay. whatever tool you're using. It just depends on what they turn on for our Okay. Agent. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. So, yeah, let's think about that. I, I like the idea of housing it someplace and um, just have it in case what if down the road we aren't with Canvas anymore, <laughs> too. That's another thing. Um, I would imagine, right, Jessica, if, if you're storing it someplace where... Yeah, you can that get was it. a huge consideration for us that if we ever move again, we would not have easy access to that stuff. Okay. Okay. So is, let's that, think is that something that our other group could house somewhere? The other, the other group that... Um, is that something well, they could you do? Know, you know what? I mean, there is OER Commons. I mean, we could, could definitely... Those are just resources. It's just a CMS at the end of the day. It's just a content repository. So certainly... Yeah, maybe we can put it in there. <laughs> you can create different modules and then probably get an embed code to be able to put it into, um, into Canvas. So let's definitely look <laughs> into that. Um, Okay, there are lots of options. So, so we'll th think about that. So I guess the answer to your question, Felice, is uh, yeah, definitely take, you know, have to take your creativity to where you want to take it as long as we're able to then access it and embed it. And probably at this point, let's try to figure out a way where we can store it so it's not necessarily all our eggs are in the canvas basket. So let's kind okay, of so let's awesome. think through that a little bit. Um, okay, excellent. So now Jessica and um, and I don't know if Josh is, is Josh here tonight. I'm not sure if I saw Josh, but Jessica, did you want to talk a little bit about your your section? Yeah, so I just shared a link in the chat room and it's to a document that's in our shared folder too. Um, I kind of focused on trying to make sure that I had a template ready for us. So it's not something that I've written out in the uh, module outline, but just trying to make sure that we have um, the end goal in mind of what we want them to be creating. So this is kind of a compilation of the last design plan uh, that was used for previous versions. I pulled some stuff from JR's wording for our, you know, what we're using as a group and then uh, adapted it a bit from there using some lesson plan ideas and those kinds of things. So there's six sections that the, uh, the MOOC participants would fill out. <laughs> what I was thinking about doing is that the first five would become permanent fixtures in the adult learning zone. So if I was an adult educator or a learner and I found the adult learning zone, I could read through the purpose, the audience, the scope, the objectives, and key terms and concepts. And I would know ahead of time, this is what this lesson covers. And then section six, which right now is the content design draft, would become the final um, the actual lesson, so the content itself. So then when you go into the adult learning zone, you would see those five um, sections and then you could access the lesson material. That is perfect. I really spent um, a, a mini dive, I wouldn't call it a deep dive, and I put up some draft lessons using the OER Commons and the op um, Open Author, and it definitely asks you for all these things, <laughs> you know, what the, what's, they call it an abstract, I believe, and um, you have to put all the, the, the um, objectives and things like that. So we definitely you and I can coordinate as we, you know, get nomenclature and things like that squared away, but that's perfect. Okay, and it sounds like a lot of these sections will relate directly back to what everyone else is covering. So once I see, you know, some of the things that people are working with, like, I think it'd be great to be able to reference back to the modules they've already covered and have them thinking through how to revise and integrate everything that they've learned. Mm -hmm. And then the last section, section six, um, is that draft of what their lesson would be. So it's the introduction, the presentation. Uh, having them think about those formative assessments, so practice and any assessment activities, and then the Creative Commons license at the end. Yay! This is great. This is this is fantastic. I, I really like it. And like I said, um, now that we know that our home will actually be OER Commons, um, I think we'll be have this have some opportunity to to tweak it to specifically what um, what's called for in there. Um, okay. 
That's excellent. Did you, did you have any questions for the SMEs? I mean, not that I can think of. The only thing I guess would be is please let me know if you see any gaps or things that would be useful to have or, um, you know, if there's anything here that maybe doesn't fit well with what the need would be, uh, we can definitely adapt it and tweak it, so. Yeah, and I think, um, as you're saying, you're, you're dovetailing with Felice as far as the Section 6, right, um, as far as how she lays out um, the first principles or something like that, and that ties into the, you know, to Josh's section as well, as far as what we would as assess and, I'm sorry, to evaluate of their work. Um, we, we need to kind of dovetail all that together, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I gave it to you late, but today I gave you the, um, the evaluation that we used last year, um, which again, hopefully the evaluation would tie, in, uh, tie into what your, <laughs> what your sections are as well. So. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay, very good. Um, anybody else? And just to, to clarify where this all fits in for the SMEs, we're having the MOOC participants do a written design plan or a design proposal um, that they will then, in Josh's sections, Josh, I don't think is here tonight, um, we're going to give them the opportunity then to self-evaluate their design proposals against a rubric. And um, after they've done that, then they'll build a, a prototype and that's where I step in and I, I really don't have too much to say at this point because I, um, I'm not nearly as comprehensive <laughs> in my, um, in my work here. Let me get up to my stage here. So there we go. So module six, seven, and eight, um, where the students are going to be in module six developing a prototype. And at this point, um, my gut is that it will be a Google Doc. And the reason being, after I played around in OER Commons, um, there's an open author feature, which was, is probably how the MOOC participants will develop their final um, deliverable. And you're able to import your Google Doc, and it does a pretty nice job. And so if we have the MOOC participants use a Google Doc to prepare their prototype, we'll have then in Module 7 a round of evaluation. Um, and I haven't really thought through that too specifically how we're going to do that with um, so many people, but um, the way we've done it historically is the SMEs and facilitators and peers have offered feedback on the prototype. And then following their, that round of formative um, evaluation, we have then had them turn in the final deliverable, which is then module eight. And so um, we, I think I mentioned it when we first started, or maybe before the recording started, we have spoken with the OER Commons folks. And unfortunately, microsites and hubs come at a fee that we aren't able to pay at this point. Hopefully down the road we could. And so we're going to go with the group feature, which is much like the example that Amanda shared with us a, a couple weeks ago, um, which is fine. It it's, gives us some nice flexibility. The big hiccup we have with OER Commons right now is the CCRS are not embedded. However, um, I do have uh, a contact who's working on her end to try to get that to happen by February so fingers crossed and if not we'll just have to use tags or something like that to align our um, MOOC participants deliverables to the the CCRS because right now the, all they have is Common Core um, and so that's it that gets us to module eight and again everybody else did a, a bang up job <laughs> except for me in six seven and eight i don't have a lot of detail um, but i'm going to actually have the adult learning zone folks help me prepare those last three three sections because that really does get into the stuff that they've been working on in terms of getting a style guide together and um and what the template will look like and how things will actually lay out within OER Commons when you upload it. And as a, a final note on this, I did give everybody access to our group. And so hopefully, if you didn't, just send me an email. I sent everybody an email that will give you your login credentials to join our group. Um, so you can get a sense for what it looks like. And actually, it's quite helpful if you go in there and try to set up a fake resource just to see what, it, what that open author looks like and uh, what they ask for. As, as I was mentioning with Jessica, they have certain things that they ask for, that, which makes it um, easy for people to be able to search for your resources and to align things appropriately with, um, with grade level and, and, and what language you're writing in and things like that. So it, it wouldn't be a bad idea if everybody spent a couple minutes poking around there. Um, and we're really pretty much up against the hour. I think if we go any further, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to really, um, get into a, 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 an over overage here. Let me just look real quickly. Um, 
talked about this template. Did anybody have any questions? Did, did you get the impression when you spoke with OER Commons that if they had more voices, that they would be more likely to add the CCRS? Um, I mean, I don't think that would hurt uh, for one, but she, she mentioned it's more of a back end thing where they get the, the database that pulls for the, like the common core standards. She just doesn't know if it, it exists. Um, and she said, if it doesn't exist, then it's a matter of they've got to pay somebody to make it exist. Um, and she used some term and I, I, it escapes me now where they draw from for like the common core. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she said that as, she, as far as she's, she knows, they don't have access to that right now. And she doesn't even know if it exists. So that's what she was digging. I talked to her last Monday and she was going to look in to see, Hey, does this, <laughs> does this database exist? And, um, if it does, can they get it? right away or are they going to have to build it if, if it doesn't exist but yeah so, do you, would you like the name of my contact <laughs> I yeah can, I can so, give you that <laughs> yeah and I mean I'll I'll email and you just let me know how many people <laughs> you want to email because I oh. know that there's a bunch of them out there um, who would be happy to to help in in getting those on there Perfect. and then I think it would just yeah, yeah. who's your contact it's Mindy Boland and uh, she was very, very nice and helpful, but it was more, if we have to build this, she, then, it, then it was like a different ball game, you know, then. Right, and then, and if, if they have to build it, I don't think that the conversation has to stop because I don't think it will work for February, but that might actually be something that Octa um, would support. Yay. And perhaps could do something about it, so. Um, Okay, Even if they say no, we can keep it going. <laughs> yeah, and she, you know, she she said she's getting, she is definitely getting a flood of requests. It's it's definitely, I was not the first person. <laughs> but what was intriguing to her, FYI, by the way, um, we, we definitely raise some attention when we say that we're putting a MOOC together to, to develop resources for adults. I, I, we kind of get a little bit more attention. So that's kind of a cool, a cool thing. Um, Okay, there's a ton of stuff. I guess we'll table it until next week, but just to give you a sneak peek of what I want to talk about in two weeks, as I mentioned, the reflections, this is, hopefully you can see my screen, um, talk about the reflections, the discussion forums, oh, badges and certifications, um, how we're going to do that for the MOOC participants. Ah, we have to somehow layer in our facilitators, and so we have to start thinking about how we're going to utilize their talents, and then also thinking about how we're going to train them to, um, to be able to do this come February. And that'll fall on me primarily to train them to do it, I guess. But um, but I certainly look toward the designers to help me think about uh, what we actually need them to to do. Also, think about during the MOOC, would there would it be beneficial to have any type of synchronous live sessions? And if so, when and how would we go about doing that? Um, and then also think about how we're going to evaluate the quality of our design. So um, we're going to have certain opportunities to do checkpoints through individual reflections. How can we incorporate some type of satisfaction measure within those reflections? How are things going? As we all know, MOOCs have horrible attrition problems. And so maybe if we're kind of keeping a pulse with our, um, keeping check with the pulse of our, our MOOC participants, we can avoid kind of a mass exodus <laughs> before, before it happens. And I also wanted to mention, um, John is doing research on persona development. Um, I mentioned with, to Kea before we started, I definitely in February want to make sure that we're turning in as many AECT uh, presentations as we can. I think just we, we, right what we've talked about tonight, we could probably do about three or four sessions at AECT. So um, one of our huge reasons for even doing this is to give folks like yourselves opportunities to present your research, present your evaluations, your designs, or whatever it is. And so um, I'm, I'm totally open to helping folks if they want to conduct research or if you want to do an evaluation or you want to do a conference proposal um, or a paper or whatever it might be. Just always keep that in the back of your mind that we should be doing that as well. Uh, well, thank you so much to our SMEs. Thank you so much to our designers. Um, if everybody's okay with it, I'm going to pass it off to email exchanges at this point. I will, when we're done here, send an, an email to everybody so everybody knows their contact information, and then I'll let that play out. And um, I'll, let's plan for being here, same place, same time, on November 11th. Okay? Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Good night. Good night. Good night.